Have you guys heard about Vessies? Well, if you haven't, let me tell you about them. Although, honestly, you have because they sponsored before and I go on about Vessies. I think even when, I don't, not, uh, when I'm not doing a sponsor read, I go on about Vessies because they are genuinely the shoes that I wear all the time. They're 100% waterproof as well, which makes them perfect for that unpredictable spring weather. But they're also super comfortable and stylish. You can wear them every day. No more clunky boots. Uh, and you can see by the uh, usage of these. I am pretty much wearing these every day at the moment. They're kind of my winter shoe. And they don't even look like a winter shoe, but they're super warm, they're super waterproof, super comfortable. Nothing to lose with Vessies. They're made from a material called Dymatex, which is a dual climate knit material that keeps you cool in the summer and warm in the winter. It's like magic. You wouldn't even think that they're waterproof. Indeed, I've been out hiking with friends of mine. And they'd be like, Simon, what shoes are you wearing? <laughs> Your feet are going to get cold and wet. And they're all wearing these like hiking boots and stuff. And I'm like, my shoes are more waterproof than your shoes. <laughs> Vessies are amazing. Look, if you live in a rainy climate, you need a pair of Vessi sneakers. If you live in a hot climate, you need a pair of Vessi sneakers. Everybody needs a pair of Vessi sneakers. And they have a huge range of stars. There's this Chelsea boot star thing. There's these, which I think are called the Stormburst. I should remember that. Then I've got a pair that I wear to the gym. I've got so many pairs in so many styles and uh, they're awesome. So check out vessi.com slash unknown and get your own pair of Vessi sneakers and use the code unknown and you'll get 15% off your entire order. So thank you to Vessi for sponsoring and now today's episode. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown, the show where we talk about mysteries, generally dumping all over them because they turn out to be not very mysterious. Stonehenge is what we're covering today. Uh, it was it was definitely aliens. <laughs> Look, Dave writes me a script. Thank you, Dave. I'm gonna read it. Never read it before. We're gonna explore this together. I feel like I've definitely made like six videos in the past about Stonehenge, so uh, I'm definitely gonna know some of this stuff if I remember any of it. Anyway, let's just jump in. Having spent most of my life living approximately one hour from Stonehenge, it's a place I've visited several times and I can categorically state that it's one of the most unusual places that I've ever been. During my first visit in around 2005, I was fortunate enough to be accompanied by a friend who, due to some form of religious dispensation that I do not fully understand, was able to get me and a few friends close enough to the stones that we could actually touch them. I think in the past they let people just go up and you could just wander in, touch it and stuff, but... I think then people were like, let's get quite damaged. <laughs> so they stopped doing that. I've never been to Stonehenge, which is, I also don't live enormously far away from it. I've driven past it several times. You're just on the motorway, like, oh, look, Stonehenge. But apparently it's a lot bigger up close. Should go see Stonehenge sometime. Although this was nearly 20 years ago, I still remember the experience with exceptional clarity. I am, even with the most generous interpretations of the term, not spiritual or religious person yet. When I first made, laid my hands upon one of the ancient stones that make up this incredible monument, I was, for the first and only time in my life, struck by an almost indescribable sensation of peace, reassurance, and solidarity. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not a religious person. I'm not a spiritual person. Um... But I think like this, like touching something that is so historic, just, I, I feel it's like similar to what people describe, you know, when they go into space and they're like, oh, the earth's really small. I feel like when you see something really old, you're like, oh yeah, time is really long. And it's like, this was made thousands of years ago and I've been around for like 30 some years. And you're just like, it's all, you know. I'm so insignificant, I can't even kill myself. I guess peaceful, also, you know, um, pointless, like slightly nihilistic. <laughs> That was the, the reason for all of this. Where do we go now? Anyway. No doubt in my mind, at least some of this reaction was caused by the large amount of cannabis that was in my system, but not all of it. I have returned to the stones on several occasions since then, while not under the influence of anything at all, and on those occasions I have experienced similar feelings. Those experiences have had a profound effect on me, not least because, as I previously mentioned, nothing like this has ever happened to me anywhere else in the world. So, when Simon asked me if I'd be interested in writing a script that covered some of the mystery surrounding Stonehenge, I jumped at the opportunity. It's crazy that I don't remember our asking this like uh, it, there's so many like pitches and suggestions around like scripts that i'm just like i don't remember but i guess i gave this one to dave rather than because dave often pitches ideas to me and i'm like yes yes no yes no yes no no yes that's how it works. Before we get into that script, let me lighten the mood a little. I thought I would briefly tell you what happens on the occasion that I decided it would be a good idea to take my dad, a deeply skeptical man and renowned practical joker, to visit what is arguably one of the most famous landmarks in Britain. After we had arrived and spent a few minutes walking around and looking at the stones, my dad quickly became bored and started up a conversation with a group of American tourists. Okay. At some
some point during this conversation. I suppose of all the tourists that you want to approach for like conversations, one, they're American, so they speak English, and two, they're American, so they'll be like, well, let's have a chat. <laughs> like Americans, you always like, I feel if there was a group of British tourists in America and an American comes up and they're like, how y'all doing? We're like, yes, very, very good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Why are we, why are we talking right now? Americans, very friendly. <laughs> British people very we're not unfriendly we're just very reserved typically like we we don't spark up random conversations with strangers whereas whenever you're in America it's like people will just chat to you you'll be in a lift and someone will just start having a chat and you're like okay <laughs> do we know each other have we have we met is I'm sorry I don't remember you and they're like oh no we've never met it's like okay <laughs> why are we having a chat then at some point during this conversation, he asked if they'd heard the news about the recent discovery. When they responded in the negative, he proceeded to tell them that archaeologists had recently discovered the original plans for the structure and work would shortly begin to finish the project in accordance with these plans. Oh God, where's your dad going, Dave? Gesturing vaguely in the direction of some construction vehicles that had been brought in to assist with the building of a nearby visitor center, he told these poor, naive tourists that they were there because work would shortly begin on the installation of the roof. One of the groups was so taken in by his lie that they immediately composed and posted a message to Facebook in order to let everyone back home know about it. To this day, I often wonder just how many people read this online and subsequently believed it without carrying out any further research. I mean, it's serious, but it's also funny. <laughs> it's picked up by CNN. <laughs> Roof to be placed on Stonehenge. Anyway, enough stories. It's time to sit back, relax, and indulge in your stimulant of choice. Crack. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. It's coffee. Dave actually sent me this coffee. He, um, it was, uh, I honestly don't know why, but thank you, Dave. Um, it was, and it's, it's incredibly strong. Apparently it's the strongest coffee in the world. It's got a name. Old Look Company. Okay, I'll give you a plug. Hold on. All right, it's called Skull Crusher Coffee. And I don't want, if, if you're watching this Skull Crusher Coffee somehow, don't send me any. <laughs> yeah, it's... Like, since Brexit, Dave sent this from the UK, it's such a hassle to receive anything. And this was expensive coffee. And I ended up paying about 50% of the price in uh, import duties because um, because Brexit. Love that. Thank you so much. Population of the UK voted for Brexit. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> it's made everything such a hassle. Why? What is Stonehenge? After briefly rereading my introduction, it occurred to me that I had somewhat naively assumed that everybody would immediately know what I was talking about. Although it's probably safe to assume that anybody who lives in the UK knows at least something about Stonehenge. Am I ignorant in thinking, like, people know what Stonehenge is? It's a fairly famous monument internationally. It's like, you know, people know what, um... Oh god, I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> that big palace in India. It's not Tutankhamun. That's the emperor. That's the, the Egyptian dude. It's something like that. God, what's the name of that palace with the spires? The guy built it for his dead wife. Um, God damn, it's so famous. The Taj Mahal. Thank you. The Taj It's like famous like that or the Empire State Building, you know? Isn't it? Or am I just British? Let me know in the comments. He's British. Have you never heard of Stonehenge, you smooth brain? For those listeners who live outside of the UK and are not familiar with the work of the Norwegian comedy duo known as... Elvis. What's the meaning of stone hair? What are you talking about? I'm not familiar with that. Uh, it might be useful to provide a little background information. Believed to have been built during the transition from the Neolithic period to the Bronze Age, with work estimated to have begun around 3000 BC and ended in 1520 BCE, Stonehenge, as its name suggests, is a large stone monument consisting of an outer ring of freestanding stones that stand about 13 feet or 4 meters in height. Oh yeah, they're much bigger than you think. Like, I always thought Stonehenge would be about my height or slightly shorter, but it's Big. These stones are connected with lintels, which are, you guessed it, also made of stone. Inside the outer circle is a small circle consisting of a number of blue stones, which in turn originally surrounded five trillions. Oh god, what the f is that, Dave? That's not a commonly used word. What is a trillion? Fortunately, I can just touch it and click look up. Trillion, a megalithic structure containing two upright stones and a third across the top as a lintel. Okay, so it's basically the Stonehenge thing. The monument stands on Salisbury Plain in the county of Wiltshire, located in the south of England. So, 
Why is it so special? Well, there are quite a few reasons. Firstly, and perhaps most obviously, it's incredibly impressive that it's still there at all. Although it has sustained serious damage during the 5,000 years or so that it's existed, it's still in comparatively good shape. Although a lot of the damage can simply be put down to the ravages of time, some pieces were removed over the years by stonemasons or farmers who, while looking for material for projects, were unable to resist this huge stockpile of resources. <laughs> the past was different right it's like yeah no why wouldn't we just knock down that ancient structure and use it to build a wall <laughs> come on let's go easy someone already dug up the rock for us sadly the most recent monument vandals have consisted of tourists who in order to make a quick buck on ebay have chipped small fragments off from the larger rocks and sold them online that should that is that's illegal right that's not cool these combined attacks notwithstanding i'm fairly sure that you would be hard pushed to find anything constructed in compliance with today's building regulations that will have held up as well as stonehenge after 5,000 years and that brings us to our next question how exactly was stonehenge built obviously it's impossible to say with absolute certainty but let's first look at the version of events given most credence by scientists historians and archaeologists yes the most sensible one no doubt we'll of course look at some of the more outlandish suggestions later on in this video because what fun is a decoding the unknown if we don't get to f it upon aliens? I don't want to ruin the surprise for anybody, but the word aliens is likely to make an appearance. Uh, ah, yes. The general assumption of present day people that people in the past were all stupid and couldn't do anything. It's generally believed that Stonehenge as we know it today was the end product of several stages, with the first stage resulting in something far less impressive than its final incarnation. According to English Heritage, quote, the first monument at Stonehenge was a circular earthwork enclosure built in about 3000 BC. The ditch was dug with simpler antler tools, and the chalk piled up to make an inner and outer bank. Within the ditch was a ring of 56 timber or stone posts. Detailed archaeological analysis suggests that the site was initially used as a site for cremating the dead for several hundred years. The next stage of re the next stage of construction is believed to have taken place in around 2150 BCE and included the addition of approximately 80 blue stones, the majority of which can still be seen today. It was at this point that some truly Herculean effort was expended on the project. You see, there was something a little bit special about these blue stones, leaving to one side aside for a moment the fact that they each weighed between two and five tons they weren't exactly what you might describe as local oh yeah isn't this like why there's a bit of a mystery around this because the stones were brought in from really far away like back in the day before people had wheels and shit. you know basic inventions can you imagine the guy who invented the wheel or have the wheel got invented that must have been some crazy shit. he's like guys i got something to show you <laughs> come check this out <laughs> and he shows them a wheel and they'll just be like bro is going to change the world and it did for whatever reason the people who had taken it upon themselves to carry out modifications on stonehenge had decided that the only stones that were suitable were some that were located 240 miles or 386 kilometers away in the Preseli mountains in south wales that's really far today that's a long drive and in the past it was even longer bearing in mind that this particular construction project took place before the invention of the wheel transporting the stones must have been a really arduous task even if they had wheels it, it's really far in the past the transport route is of course somewhat uncertain however having spent nearly a day reading the work of people who have studied this sort of thing for their entire working lives i believe that the most likely route is as follows although many of the stones are undoubtedly quarried from the mountain there is evidence to suggest that several of them were taken from a pre-existing nearby monument but they had all been assembled they were dragged on wooden rollers to what is now known as milford haven before being transported by raft along the south coast of wales up the rivers avon and from before being rolled overland to the river wiley 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 why don't care whereupon they were once again transported by raft to the salisbury avon and on to amesbury before making the short journey to the final destination what? rafts and like that must have been a big ass raft because didn't they say they were like several tons <laughs> i remember building like we'd, we'd build rafts on like adventure weekends as part of school or whatever and they would always be it's always so much harder than you think and then they always fall apart like halfway through these guys built rafts for like tons of stones it's kind of and they didn't even have barrels and to use once the stones had finished the epic journey they were arranged in an incomplete double circle at the center of the henge it would not be until the third stage of development that they were moved once again to form the more familiar arrangement that we know today the third and final stage included the installation of the outer ring of larger stones the adjoining lintels and the five trilci trilithons the stone things that we talked about before they would arrange be arranged in a horseshoe shape at the center this final stage is believed to have taken place in about 2000 bce and demonstrates some truly remarkable construction techniques but 
Before these remarkable techniques could be put into practice, the builders once again found themselves in need of material. Fortunately for those tasked with the job of locating the necessary building materials, there was a plentiful supply of sarsen, the type of stone used in the construction of both the outer ring and the center trillthians. Why is this word? If this word is hard to say, just be like stonehenge stars okay i can't think of the appropriate word to replace it fine trillthians it is trillisons trillis whatever it's about 20 miles 32 kilometers away on the area of the marlborough downs known as westwoods although this was considerably closer to the mountains of south wales given that the stones used in this third phase weigh on average about 25 tons transporting them even over this comparatively short distance was still an impressive feat in and of itself no wheels 25 tons that's 25 small cars for each stone. That's fucking nuts. Due to the sheer mass of the stones, using the nearby river for transport was not an option, and so they were dragged the entire distance by hand. According to an article in the New Zealand Herald, calculations have shown that it would have taken 500 men using leather ropes to pull one stone, with an extra 100 men needed to lay the rollers in front of the sledge. Once the stones were on site, the truly remarkable construction techniques that we spoke of earlier came into play. Using only simple hammers and chisels, the stonemasons shaped these giant lumps of sarsen. This shaping process included creating protruding tendons on top of their upright stones. Sorry, tenons, not tendons. Tendons are the thing in your arm. Tenons. I'm learning all sorts of archaeological terms today. A mate of mine from school is an archaeologist, which is such an unusual... He always wanted to be an archaeologist. Like, ever since we were kids, he's like, yeah, I want to be an archaeologist. And then he went to university to study archaeology. And then he became an archaeologist like Indiana Jones. He's got a whip. No, he doesn't. But like, I don't really know many people who are like, yeah, 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 no, I wanted to, like, were so certain about what they wanted to do. I'm fairly sure when he was wanted to be an archaeologist, I was like, I'm going to be an astronaut. And, uh, yeah, that's cool. And he loves his job. He's like, yeah, being an archaeologist is great. <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is great. It all worked out. Tenon is a projecting piece of wood made for insertion into a mortise in another place. What is a mortise? <laughs> Why am I so stupid? Oh, mortise is... Oh, there's a little, like, Ikea-looking diagram here. It's just, like, one thing that slots into another thing. Bada-bing, bada-boom. Easy. Dave, mate, you got to remember I've got a smooth and tiny brain. In addition to this, either a tongue or a groove was carved into the end of each lintel so that the entire outer structure slotted seamlessly together. What does seamlessly mean, Dave? No, I'm just kidding. I know what seamlessly means. It's without a seam. What's a seat? No, I'm just kidding. The use of these techniques, primarily found only in woodworking, demonstrates a level of craftsmanship only usually associated with far more modern construction. So, we now have a rough idea of how Stone Age was probably built, but let's now have a look at why. Unfortunately, it's necessary to repeat a phrase that has already come up several times in this script. Nobody is completely sure. Wait, has that already come up? I don't feel we've been, I guess, a little bit about moving the stones and stuff. I guess I wasn't paying attention. My bad. Should drink more of this desperately powerful coffee from Skull Crusher Coffee. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> They're not a sponsor. I'm not getting paid. Once again, we will look. <laughs> Skull Crusher Coffee. <laughs> Once again, we will look at the suggestions that are the most scientific evidence and move on to some, shall we say, slightly more outlandish suggestions later on. I promise. I promise. The aliens are coming. <laughs> One thing that almost everybody within the scientific community agrees on is that Stonehenge, or at least the site of Stonehenge, has been used for several different things over the years. Well, yeah, definitely. Now it's a tourist site. Before that, it was, um, they were cremating the bodies. Before that, after that, sorry, people were nicking bits to make walls and shit. As I mentioned earlier, it's widely believed that in its first incarnation it was used as a cremation site. There we go. This hypothesis, at least, has a reasonable amount of supporting evidence. Archaeological excavation that has taken place on the site has unearthed huge amounts of burnt or partially burnt skeletal remains. Interestingly, although many of these were discovered during an archaeological dig in the 1920s, there was very little interest in either studying or displaying these remains at that time. According to one archaeologist who has studied the remains more recently, quote, These people have been cremated. They did not have nice skulls with gleaming teeth to display. They had bundles of ash and pieces of broken bone. The archaeologists were not interested in those objects. At that time, it was firmly believed that there was nothing you could learn from looking at cremated bone. Yeah, I, that's one of those things. I'm like, I don't I don't know what you could learn from looking at crem cremated bone but i'm always like just never underestimate the sort of technology that they can make in the future like all that you know dna evidence that was thrown away like that or that just doesn't exist now because people are like well how that, that's not possible i'm just like okay yeah maybe it's useless 
But just in case it's not, let's just bag it up and keep it in a box in a warehouse somewhere just in case in the future they come up with some magical technology which is able to do something with that. Because the future is going to be amazing. These bones were considered so scientifically insignificant that in 1935 they were reburied at the site. More recently, the bones were once again removed and transported to Sheffield University to undergo thorough analysis, and the results were fascinating. And this is, uh, I believe, with archaeology now. When they're digging up a site, they'll purposefully not excavate the whole thing or, like, leave bits because they'll be like, hmm. We don't know what future archaeologist technology is going to exist, so let's just leave that bit for people from the future, just in case they come up with something really cool. Although next to nothing is known about human social construct from the time of Stonehenge, analysis of these bones has allowed archaeologists to gather evidence which supports the theory that even so long ago the country was run by at least one group of social elites, and it was these individuals who were chosen for burial at Stonehenge. <laughs> Yeah, and every time through history, it's always like, I wonder how long before the humans put a hierarchy in place. Human, We just love hierarchies. We're just into that shit. We're just not into everything being equal. We've tried it many times, and it always comes back to like, let's make sure there are some social elites. <laughs> It's weird, isn't it? The bones that were excavated appear to have come from comparatively healthy individuals and show very little sign of the damage caused by hard labor. Additionally, they seem to mostly be mostly male and mostly have died between the ages of 25 and 40. This information, although not entirely surprising, has led archaeologists to infer that they came from a patriarchal society with most, if not all, positions of power and responsibility being held by men. Ah, yes, the good old days. <laughs> but what about the second and third stages? What could possibly have been so important that it necessitated the transporting of almost 100 incredibly heavy stones hundreds of miles from their original location. As for the stones, the most likely reason that they were transported from Wales is that whoever organized the second stage wanted to include some aspects of the previously mentioned much more ancient monument from which many of them were taken. Unfortunately, we know even less about the aforementioned monument than we do about Stonehenge, so although this theory is the most popular, it remains just that theory. One of the few things that we definitely do know about the last stages of construction is that it was at this point when it began to take on a far greater cultural significance. It has long been believed that Stonehenge was constructed as some sort of calendar, but until very recently, it was not entirely clear how it worked. If you were to start- oh, they, I, didn't, I didn't know they'd figure this out. <laughs> so what? Whenever I say this, someone is always in the comments being like, Simon, here at timestamp, you know, 14 minutes and three seconds on this video, you said this. And it's like, yeah, bro, I say a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff. Someone emailed me the other day, was like, hey, I'm just like interested. Like, how do you remember all of the stuff? Y you must either be really good at remembering or really good at teleprompter. I'm like, bro, which one do you think it is? <laughs> like... You think I just remember all this shit off the top of my head? A mate of mine who's a YouTuber, for the longest time, he would do, he would present a video like this. If you were to stand in the center of Stonehenge, he'd look down at a script that he had off camera, then he'd look at the camera and read it out loud. And I'm like, bro, what are you up to? And he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, why didn't you have a teleprompter? And he's like, oh, they're too expensive. And I'm like, what are you up to? <laughs> you make like plenty of money. Just buy the teleprompter. And I think he thought they'd be like super expensive because they're all like in newsrooms or whatever. I, the one, I'm, I'm not reading off a teleprompter now, obviously, but the uh, the one I have that is attached to the front of the camera, I'm looking at, it was like, what, 100 quid? It's less than 100 quid? And the other ones I have are a little bit more fancy, but they're still like less than 200 quid and you just put an iPad in the bottom of it. Boom. If you were to stand in the center of Stonehenge on the morning of the longest day of the year, you would see the sun rise directly to the left of what is referred to as the hillstone. Originally, there were two stones and the sun would have risen directly in between them. There is a second alignment to the southwest which highlights the shortest day of the year. Although this feature would have undoubtedly been useful to keep track of the changing seasons and when carrying out ceremonial observances, Stonehenge expert Timothy Darville believes that the capabilities of the monument were much more complex. During the COVID-19 pandemic, he took advantage of the lack of tourists at Stonehenge and carried out his own extensive research. Writing for the journal Antiquity, he says the following. A ring of 30 upright sarsen stones once stood in a circle representing each day of the month for a total of 360 days a year. That's not quite right. While some are now missing, excavation shows that they were once present in uniform size and shape. The additional five days needed to be consistent with the solar year are found in five structures in the Trilthian horseshoe within the center of Stonehenge. Oh, look, people in the past with their big brains. Four stones on the outside of the circle kept track of the leap year every four years. 
The top of the circle is thought to illuminate the summer solstice, and the bottom, the winter solstice. This is what always blows my mind, because it's like people in the past, this was like, what, thousands of years ago? If someone was like, okay, Simon, given all you know, given all you know, even what you've just read, go and make one of these, and I'll be like, I don't know how. I wouldn't be able to figure it out. (laughs) And I'm in the modern age, having been educated and have all of this knowledge, and still I'll be like, it's going to take me a long time to figure that out. The way the sun shines through the monument told ancient people the timing of each solstice and when the auspicious days of a harvest festival uh, would have to be celebrated. If you go to Stonehenge, you can pick out which sarsen stone represents the current day within the month. It all works quite nicely. End quote. Given that the average person of the time would have been unlikely to be able to calculate these things themselves, anybody who fully understood the workings of Stonehenge would most likely have been granted almost godlike status. Imagine being able to proclaim in the middle of winter that you're just foreseen that times would get better and days would get longer, only to have your proclamation come true. It is little wonder that there is so much evidence of the Henge being a popular gathering site. Alternative theories. Up until this point, everything that I have written has at least some archaeological or scientific basis to back it up. But now is the time that we look at some of the altogether less likely explanations behind Stonehenge. Perhaps the most popular myth associated with Stonehenge comes from Geoffrey of Monmouth in his Histories of the Kings of Britain, which until very recently, relatively speaking, was considered to be an accurate historical account. As the story goes, during the 5th century, both Saxon and British leaders met on Salisbury Plain in order to attempt to negotiate a truce and agree land-sharing terms. Although it was agreed that everybody who attended would be unarmed, the Saxons double-crossed the British. Those devilish Saxons and many of the noblemen were assassinated. Some years later, a prince known as Aurelius Ambrosius, along with his brother, uh, along with his brother Uther Pendragon, both of whom had been in exile in France, returned to the site of the massacre and agreed that some sort of monument should be put in place to honor the fallen. Pendragon discussed the matter with the wizard Merlin. Wait, when did we think this was real? <laughs> We know Merlin's fake. It's King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table fake. And Merlin said, If thou be fair to grace the burial place of these men with a work that shall endure forever, send for the dance of the giants that is in Caloris, a mountain in Ireland. For a structure of stones is there that none of this age could raise, save his wit were strong enough to carry his art. What, Merlin? <laughs> Sometimes you read a sentence from the past and I'm like, what, what are you trying to say, Merlin? That was a nightmare to read. What with who were thou? Oh, Merlin continues, For the stones be big, nor there is stone anywhere of more virtue. And so they be set up round this plot in a circle, even as they be now set up, th- set, there set up. Here shall they stand forever. Oh, Merlin. (laughs) Learn to speak, Merlin. 15,000 men were dispatched to retrieve the stones, but although they were able to defeat the defending army, they were not able to move the stones. Legend has it that at this point, Merlin used his magical powers to transport the stones to Salisbury Plain, where they still remain to this day. Although this is a great story, I think it's fairly safe to say that it can be completely discounted. Firstly, it has been scientifically proven that Stonehenge was in place long before this story takes place. Second, there is no credible historical evidence that verifies the existence of any of the people in this story. And thirdly, if Merlin was capable of magically transporting the stones, then why did they need to send 15,000 men in the first place? (laughs) Because none of it's real. How, when did they think this was historically accurate? How long ago was that? Come on, people. We know Merlin's not real. The almost inconceivable age of Stonehenge puts pay to many of the more popular legends regarding its construction. Some people have claimed that it was built by the Romans. That's a little bit off and was originally designed to be the centerpiece for some sort of palace. But if that were true, the Romans would have had to have started work in Britain an exceptionally long time before they were in Britain. Similarly, claims that it was originally constructed by a Druid as a Druid place of worship must also be dismissed as the original structure predates Druidism. Aliens No slightly baffling problem would be complete without at least one group claiming alien involvement and Stonehenge is no exception. Are we gonna, how long until we get to the mention of the History Channel? I'd say two paragraphs. You don't have to go Google too hard to find websites and YouTube channels that are dedicated to this topic, and I imagine that exactly none of you will be surprised to hear one paragraph that it has frequently been discussed on History Channel's Ancient Aliens show. Most of the, I feel like History Channel should be, whenever we see it say History Channel, you drink! Or whenever History Channel is in print anywhere, it should have quotation marks around it like History Channel. 
You know what I mean? Most of the alien theories are based around two issues that certain people have with the current scientific and archaeological explanations. The first of these is how were the stones moved all the way from Wales? Although we have already covered the answer to this fairly conclusively, there are those who vociferously claim, often with their fingers in their ears, that wooden rollers would not be strong enough to support the weight of the stones. Sadly for these individuals, we know that's not true. Scientists are not usually in the habit of proposing theories and then not bothering to test them, and this case is not an exception. Yeah, that's what scientists do. They come up with a hypothesis and then they test the hypothesis, or some other scientist does. That's, and then someone else tests it as well to make sure that the first scientist was right. It's how science works. Good on you, scientists. Oh my god, I had this coffee is so intense. It's not hot in here, and I swear I have a little sweat on my brow. <laughs> this is not normal, and I feel like mega caffeinated. Woo! Probably didn't help that I made an entire pot of the stuff. Pulse feels normal at least. On more than a few occasions, the log rolling concept has been tested and proved to be viable. I also feel compelled to mention that the moving of massive, massive stones has often been facilitated by the use of massive, massive whip. Ah! So this is another technique that some historians believe may have been used. <laughs> Get those stones moving. I can't move that stone. That's far. I can't move the stone. I move the stone. Sorry. The second argument that is often used to back up the alien involvement theory is the lack of stonemasonry skill around that time. Although it is certainly true that there's a very little evidence to suggest that joinery techniques uh, used in the creation of the second and third stages of Stonehenge were in common use at the time, it is generally accepted that these techniques were used when working with wood, and therefore it's not an inconceivable stretch of the imagination to suggest that they may have been adapted. Yeah, for something important enough, they'd be like, let's just do the wood thing. And they're like, with stone? With stone? Are you... But why do people think that aliens traveled thousands of light years just to build a few stone circles and a handful of pyramids? Again, there are several popular theories. The first of these, most often referred to as the helping hand or something similar, implies that tired of watching us struggle to make any sort of progress, these alleged alien life forms just stop by to teach us a bit of stonemasonry and joinery before heading home again and occasionally popping back to monitor our progress. Sounds incredibly likely. The second theory was popularized by Swiss author, oh god, this guy again, Eric von Dan in his famous book chariot of the gods later na na later named chariot of the gods with a question mark on the end because uh there was something with something but he had to be less certain about it <laughs> a lie anyway and i'm like well it has to be believable in this book von daniken postulated that stonehenge had been built by aliens was a replica of the solar system and could be used as an alien landing pad of course because the aliens who've traveled thousands of light years need some rocks to land on eric you're insane bro in my opinion. As there is no verifiable evidence of it ever being used as such, in my opinion at least, it seems like an awful lot of work for very little use. The third and final theory that I'm going to mention today is definitely my favorite. First put forward by David Hatcher Childress, the theory, which he calls the World Grid, suggests that Stonehenge and a number of other ancient monuments were constructed by aliens in order to recharge their space-going vehicles. Right, right, that makes sense. They recharge them with rocks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's why. They need rocks. According to Hatch Childress, the world grid is an intelligent geometric pattern of the Earth and its energies. A wave of the sun, a wave of the sunlight hits the Earth and wraps the Earth like a ball of string of energy, creating this energy grid. No, it doesn't, Hatcher. That's not how it works, Hatcher. What are you talking about? Although nobody else seems to be aware of this grid, our alien visitors certainly were, and to that end set about utilizing this resource. Hatcher Childress goes on to say, By placing megalithic monuments along this grid, UFOs can then take energy off of this energy grid by going to certain power points like Stonehenge. The craft can hover over these energy spots, draw energy from those spots in order to help replenish the craft. Bruh. Bruh. <laughs> it's not that, okay? It's not that. So why can't so why can we as humans not utilize these wireless charging pads? Well, Hatch Children says an answer for that too. It's because they're broken. Oh no! While playing with a scale electric set in order to demonstrate a simple circuit, he explains that due to the fact that all these structures have sustained serious damage over the years, the electrical flow has been interrupted and the world network is no longer functional. Wow, it's so disappointing and that something so real and realistic just stopped working. It's such a shame poor aliens. So, Simon and listeners, I'll leave it up to you to decide which theory is most likely. Is it the most scientifically supported theory that we spoke of at the beginning? Is it the legend of Merlin, the helping hand, the world grid, or an amalgamation of all of the above, or something else different altogether? No, it's the science one. It's the archaeologists one. They're the sensible ones. And it's obvious. Come on. 
Like, I mean, it's not obvious. I would have no idea what it was. But like, once the archaeologists have told you what it is, you're like, oh yeah, cool. Well done for finding that out, mate. Before we finish today, I would like to say that take this opportunity to say that if you ever find yourself in the vicinity of Stonehenge, it's truly worth a visit. Brought to you by the Stonehenge County Council. <laughs> tourism council or whatever thank you for being here for this episode about stonehenge relatively short one today how about that uh if you like this show please do leave it a review uh, if you listen to it as a podcast if you're on youtube like subscribe and i'll see you next time